row consecutively on a device before it will turn to the next head. So if a different head is bad, I might still read. I mean, in 4 million sectors, I might still have you know a, a, a 3K Word document or a picture or something like that. I might still have enough that I can actually make something out of it before I had to switch the heads and then try to fill in that hole with the bad data. Okay? So I will read 75% of the drive. I'll just turn off the bad head. And I have a piece of equipment that actually lets me do that. Uh, you could still read it. It's just going to take you a lot longer. And there's always potential for more damage, just so you know. But there's a possibility of actually doing that or turning the head back on and then reading the rest of the data. And then this is another picture of uh, the actual tool as I was inserting it. This is on a two and a half inch drive, how I could actually repair the heads, replace the heads, and go through that process. There's one of the things that happens with, uh, with drives when you have a head that's stuck to a platter. You guys know what stiction is? Everybody remember stiction? So the lubrication or something would actually dry, the head would stick to the platter and it wouldn't move, and there wasn't enough force for the head to break free, so the platter just stayed still and didn't move. So when you're listening for problems, you're listening to say, well, is this a head problem, is this a platter problem? Well, it's kind of a toss-up which one, what problem that categorize this is. But basically, the head is stuck to the platter. This is the sound you will normally hear. So you hear something that sounds like Star Trek phasers. There is another one that happens a lot too, and it's this one. You hear that? So that's a head stuck to the platter. So in most cases, I can, do, I can do a couple of things, but basically what I need to do is break the head free from the platter. And so, you know, in the old days with fiction, the common thing was like to whack the drive or something like that. That's not very scientific and you can cause more problems. It's a lot easier if you know, hey, this is a Seagate drive, not a Western Digital maybe, and open it up and be able to actually create enough tension to move the head. Normally, wherever the head is parked is going to have bad sectors on it. You're going to have trouble reading it. So uh, I'll show you a picture in a minute of a way to break the motor free because I have a motor section on how to actually do that. But those sounds are the sounds of a head stuck to a platter. Those are actually fairly good signs because if the head stuck to the platter, then it means you actually probably don't have any functioning problem that once we actually get the drive spinning, it will work and you'll just lose a couple of sectors, you'll probably be able to read the rest of your data fine. So that's pretty good. There's a simple thing that's called uh, uh, TVSs. So TVSs, and you'd be amazed at how many times that this is actually the problem. They have a voltage suppressor, basically it's a fuse. That if there's static electricity or there's too much voltage or something comes across, it just burns this fuse. And it happens fairly quickly. So you'll see like Seagate 640s, you'll see a lot of Western Digitals, a lot of IBMs. Uh, most of those will all have this kind of sensor on. Not many two and a half, I don't think that I've seen them, but, uh, but typically on three and a half inch drives. So near the power connector somewhere, you'll see these two black things. They'll typically have one connector on each side. And so the bigger one is usually your 12 volt sensor, and the smaller one is usually your 5 volt sensor. So if you power on the device and the motor doesn't spin, you hear nothing from it. Look for these. These things will be in a couple of places, so you might see ones like this. And believe it or not, all you have to do, all they do is suppress the voltage. So when they're not working, they short the board. It doesn't work. All you have to do to fix them is this. I'm not kidding. Like This is like 40-50% of these drives. You take a pair of pliers, you go find your two, and you rip them off. And that's all you got to do. Now you can test them with a meter and go through this other process to see. And obviously if you're not planning on using this drive again, fine, rip them off or whatever. I'm not saying just go gung-ho and let's go rip stuff off of, of boards and stuff. But I'm just saying that that's a potential issue if the motor doesn't spin and you've got these TVS chips on here, fairly easy and quick to actually fix if the motor's not spinning. It does not always mean that that's the only one you have to refer to my flowchart from previous of the other thing. Electronics and burning chips. So uh, basically a lot of times, you know, people kind of want to know, well, I, you know, and occasionally I get lucky and I catch one of these on video. So that's what I did. I caught a burning chip on video. So, so this is what it's going to look like. And if you watch this corner right here, this is the area you want to look at, okay? <clears throat> yeah, right, and then smoke comes off and the whole thing. So that's what happens. The, now, this is the motor control chip. This particular one, I know it looks a lot like those serial chips and stuff, but uh, uh, basically the serial chip is somewhere else on this board. But uh, 
but this was the motor control chip. And so in this particular case, uh, all I had to do was move my, my chip, my serial chip, or in this case, maybe even just replace the board because there may not have been anything unique on this board. But, uh, but that is typically what it'll end up looking like. Like you'll actually end up with a, a burnt chip on it. And this is the motor control chip. Uh, and you'll see things too, like if you do a comparison between them. So this is another board and you can see, and it's really hard to see when you're looking at a whole board. If you actually had this whole board in your hand, it would take you a little bit of looking to actually see that it's burnt, even though it looks really obvious on here. Uh, it looks great when you actually blow stuff up, but um, it's sometimes hard to see. And sometimes you'll actually see like a little ding in a chip, or you'll see a crack like this in the chip, but you won't actually see the burn marks. You can almost always smell them. The smell of the burnt chip is actually a good giveaway all the time. And I smell a lot of drives. What are you doing? Uh, seeing if I have heroin on. No, anyway, uh, <clears throat> so anyway, so that's one of the things you can do. In this particular case, it would be easy to unsolder this chip and move this chip. Anytime you have a question about what chips are, too, most of the time, unless they're burnt up, you can't see the numbers. But you can typically type those into a website somewhere, and somebody will tell you what they are. So uh, it's not usually that hard to actually find out what they are. So let's talk about soldering for a second. Um, before a couple of years ago, soldering was a big deal. It's actually a lot of work in a lot of cases and a lot of damage to desolder a chip and then solder it someplace else. So these guys came up with something a few years back called Chip Quick which has actually been the savior for the cheap or the hobbyist kind of guys. Uh, most of us have to go to what's a higher end, like air soldering, desoldering equipment, which I actually have, and I can show you some pictures of that. But let's say on the low end, on the do-it-self cheap stuff, this is what you're actually going to look at. This, uh, the actual chip quick itself, now this whole container is like 100 bucks, but the chip quick itself is only like 18 bucks. So you could just buy the chip quick, get a halfway decent soldering gun, and do this stuff yourself. So let me show you from chip quick site what this basically looks like in like a minute. Chip Quick is essentially a low melting point solder that when heated remains molten long enough to release all the pins at once on a surface mount chip. Watch how long this drop stays molten. To desolder a chip, first apply paste flux to the pins, then mix in Chip Quick solder so that it covers all the pins. Now continuously heat all the sides until the chip can be pushed off. And it really is that easy. With solder wick. Or as the manufacturer and then do it again and basically solder it back on. But it really is that easy, and even for complex chips and stuff. But it might take you 30 minutes to kind of get the hang of it to actually get it down, and instead of the 30 seconds that it took him to do it. Um, but I have done fairly complex chips uh, and been able to actually move them and do whatever. But trust me when I tell you, take pictures of them before and after so that you know where the alignment is and everything is before you actually turn the thing on. Because a lot of times, I mean, you rotate the chip one way and just not remember, or sometimes there's a little tick mark on the corner or something, double check it. Just trust me. Uh, you can do more complicated ones. This is called an air soldering and desoldering re rework station. Basically what it does is uh, you put your flux on the thing. You don't have to put anything else on it. You can heat it up to 400 degrees or so or whatever it is right before this board's going to melt, and then the chip will actually just pop right off. And, uh, and I actually use microscopes. I have a microscope for going back and resoldering. And this is actually a picture out of my microscope uh, of something more complicated. So if you end up with a chip that's way too complicated for you to do, and I do not suggest you do this directly on the board that you are doing your drive from the first time. If you, if you have a drive and you know this chip needs to be moved, go practice with a couple old drives first before you do this. I have people that will actually send me emails like, hey, I need to do a head replacement. Where do I get this head from? Like, did you try 12 other drives first before you actually tried to do the one head you need? And then after they screw it up, then they're like, well, maybe I should have practiced first. Okay. All right, so let's talk about motors for a minute because this is your other big problem. <coughs> if the motor's not spinning or you have some other problem and you can't deal with it. All right, this is what it'll look like. This is actually just powered. I am not plugging in and unplugging the power. I am turning the power on and I am leaving the power on. And it will just sit here for like... This is really like less than a minute video. Uh, but it will sit there and jiggle back and forth like this all the time. If I was just waiting for the system to think this was ready, it would never come ready on the system. But it is possible that I can actually deal with this motor in a number of different ways. It'll, it'll never start to spin up, so it'll never unlock the pins. The head will never move out of position. Look how slow that thing is spinning, too. And jiggle, and then even once it actually starts to spin, it's still not spinning at an appropriate speed. So this is actually a fairly easy problem to fix. Uh, this drive will be useless when we're done with it. But for now, it's an easy problem to fix. So I'm going to show you a couple of different ways. Now, 